We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground, traveling route, and home for many Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We would also like to acknowledge that the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Putral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We stand in solidarity with murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, transgender, and two-spirit people. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening and thanks to the Edmonton Public Library for hosting this event. I'm really excited to be here tonight with Danny, my collaborator, and Danny is a, truly a Renaissance man. He's the drummer for the band July Talk, which has just been nominated for a 2021 Juno for Alternative Album of the Year, and a Breakthrough Group of the Year at the 2014 Juno Awards, and they where they won the, the uh, and they've also won the Juno for Alternative Album of the Year twice in 2015 for July Talk's self-titled debut album, and then again in 2017 for their sophomore album, Touch, which just went gold. Their first, uh, their first album just went platinum, and Touch has gone gold. And he has received gold record status for... Um, two certified gold sing singles for guns and ammunition, push and pull. And he's also the, the drummer for the band Tongue Helmet. And in addition to all that, he's also a well-renowned bird and wildlife photographer. And my brief bio is that I'm pleased to say that I am Capital City Press featured writer for the first, these first few months of 2021. My major publication credits include the Santa, Santa Rosa Trilogy, Broke City, Northeast, and Santa Rosa. I have uh, two other books of, of poetry. My first uh, novel, Recurring Fictions, came out 20 years ago now with U of A Press. But um, recently, what I've really had a lot of fun doing is collaborating. Um, on music projects. I've done a couple with Sasha Liebrand. And um, my most recent collaboration is with Danny. And I first became aware of his bird photo uh, photography two, three years ago now, Danny, I think. Yeah. And I was absolutely blown away. Um, his unique way of looking at the world and, and letting you see, uh, you know, for, uh, from a bird's eye view, no pun intended and pun intended, of um, these beautiful birds is very evocative and for me certainly inspiring. And I'm wondering, Danny, could you just talk a bit about how you began photographing birds and wildlife and how, and how you began birding? Yeah. Well, I guess I've been a lover of nature and animals um, for my whole life at different levels, I guess. I've become a lot more aware of it recently and been a lot more active in it. But it really happened when I was on tour um, in the U.S. We were in Florida at that time um, and I was just out for a hike like I usually would do like in the morning I would get up early and go walk around by myself because we were on the road so much. We were on the road for five six years straight and you're always together with the same people who become your family and you love them but you at the same time don't want to be with your family 24-7. So you need a little bit of your own downtime and so what I would do is just leave and go out and hike and walk around cities, whatever. And on this one occasion, I noticed there was two birds, big birds, which I thought at the time were probably 
egrets or herons. They ended up being sandhill cranes. And they're just hanging on the front lawn of this house. Um, and I watched them for probably like 20 minutes to half an hour, like as long as they were there. They didn't really bother with me. And for some reason, I was just fascinated by it. Um, and so I walked away and I was like, am I into birding? Like what's going on? I don't really understand. And throughout the tour, I just started like, as the tour went on, I was just really thinking about birding. And I was like, is that a hobby I want to get into? And how do I present that, that to people? Because it's so weird for my personality, I guess, and for what I do as a job that I was like, I'll just joke about it and be like, I'm going to be the best birder by the time I'm 60. So I got to start now, like kind of joking around deal. I didn't really tell anyone. Um, and then we got to Montreal and I went to an indigo or a chapters and I went to the bird section, the nature section, I guess. And I bought my first field guide and I went out for another hike to the mountain. And I just started looking at whatever birds I could find. And that was like really the start of it. I did find out later because Leia from July Talk looked into it. She, I, uh, Vice did like a mini documentary on my bird photography and like my drumming and how kind of yin yang and different the worlds are. And she did a little inner blurb in it. And she looked up when she thought I got into birding. And apparently when we were in Australia on my Instagram, I have some pictures of birds from then but I was just taking it with my camera and it didn't really register that I was like a birder at that point. Um, and Josh, our bass player jokingly kind of, well, I guess he weirdly thinks when we were up, we were up North, we were on tour and I was driving and everyone was asleep and I'm driving the van through the, the wilderness of Northern Ontario. And all of a sudden I just see this bird flying out of the, the forest. And of course you think you're going 120 and you think that the bird's just going to fly right over top of your van, but it happened to collide with our windshield, which was maybe one of the loudest bangs I've ever heard. And everyone woke up immediately and thought that we had been in a, a car accident. So Josh thinks that um, the spirit of that hawk, it ended up being a hawk, somehow entered <laughs> into my, <laughs> anyways, he was joking. We're not really thinking that but yeah long story wow. short florida <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and you have your own logo drummers who love birds if if anyone wants to check it out on instagram or or your site it's a pretty cool logo well i mean the originally when i started posting photos on instagram i was in love with doing it but i wasn't sure as i said like i post a couple pictures of swans or you know what i mean um, but I did the hashtag drummers who love birds. And at first people thought that was pretty funny because the other, you know, birds can also be implied to, you know, a bit of a misogynistic <laughs> thing, I guess. But, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, people just really reacted to that hashtag and it became what I called my bird site, I guess. And I had one of my good friends, Justin Lapine, who's also, he's a hip hop, he's a rapper that I work with. His name's Choke and he does like graffiti and stuff like that. So he just drew that logo for me, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a great logo. Yeah. Well, how do you, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the, we're gonna talk a little bit more about cross genre pollination, but how does your, birding and your photography inform your drumming and vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I guess all uh, being creative in general, I guess you're just, your personality comes through in everything you're doing as you know. I mean, I don't know how 100% connected until possibly this project, how they were all like really intertwined and connected. What they really were more about was like almost mental health and just being a happy person. And that side, like the nature side of it really helped, you know, if I was feeling frustrated or upset, you know what I mean? That would just like really like bring me back to reality. 
mm-hmm. just being out in nature. So that's like a bigger part. That's like a really big motivation. And on top of that, just the cherry on top is that it's another uh, amazing creative process. But I can just, even if I'm not doing photos, I'm always birding, it feels like. I'm always, as I think Brian and Leslie, I'm always looking at birds at the window or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Well, you have to you have to be on constant watch for that perfect shot, right? Exactly. Well, there's been many times where I haven't had my camera handy. So that's, you know, my, and some of the, you know, best bird experiences I've had, like seeing a mandarin duck in Poland, which is, I think very strange, but I saw two mandarin ducks in Poland. I didn't happen to have my camera, which I was kicking myself for, but yeah. You have your camera with you now though. Did you want to just in case show the, yeah, <laughs> the participants the camera? Yeah, I don't have the greatest a little bit? here, but there's my camera, big lens, 150 to uh, 600 millimeter lens. I mean, it's a, it's a, professional camera but it's not top of the line it's a canon 5d mark ii so it's an older version that i got used and the lens is a sigma 150 to 600 so camera gear is very expensive i mean hopefully i'll upgrade at some point but right now it seems to be doing the job I'm happy. Yeah, between cam camera gear and studio gear you're you're pretty much set yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I feel like you're kind of lucky. You just, all you need is a pen and paper and you're pretty set. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, an imagine a bit of an imagination right? and, <laughs> and time, but we talked, we talked about this cross pollination and, you know, writing is such a solitary activity. And that's maybe one of the reasons I enjoy collaborating with artists and musicians right and when i saw when i first saw your photographs i was i was absolutely inspired um which was so cool to me and so i was i was flattered i guess is the word you know what i mean whenever people like my photos even i'm very flattered so but that's extra amazing and the amount of uh i don't know what you did with that inspiration is inspiring <laughs> in itself. Well, and, that, the, <laughs> and that's the cross pollination, right? I think I first pitched the idea to you about three years ago. Yeah. Right? Two or three years. Yeah. I mean, the, so, the, the, the book's been, I, well, we probably worked on it for about a year or so. We did. Yeah. And, and then, but we've been out there, out there. Yeah. It's, it's out there. Hopefully. Um, so we've so got, got a few uh, published with it, have you not? Yeah, oh yeah, we've, there's been some poems that have already been published from the book, but I think our, our vision for this particular project, at least at this, this point, was the, the book of photographs and then companion poems, but we're planning on taking this collaboration one step further and Danny's going to put music to some of the um, the poems, my vocal tracks. So stay tuned. Stay tuned for that project. Yeah, um, we did try to do one already, which we can't. Yeah. Wish. the demo version. But I I will say that it was very fun to make. I got very excited about it. Yeah, it it because it is it's going I, to be great. Like I do produce a lot of hip hop and stuff like that. So it's not that far off. It's a spoken word poetry record. So it's pretty cool. The You can do whatever type of music to it really. Yeah. It feels like. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that I've also liked about this project is that for me, I've learned so much. I've become interested in birding, but with each, photograph and each poem that I write other influences and and genres come in as well there was um one poem called Roscoe came back in February 
And this is the photograph, everyone. Which was taken in Aurora, Ontario, when I was out for a walk with Brian and Leslie, who are in this, joined in this meeting. And so um, <clears throat> that photograph got me thinking about Rothko, the artist Rothko. And that's what I really like about working with your photos, Danny, is that they, they conjure up so many additional evocative images. So I'm well, going to read. What I really, sorry to interrupt, but what blows my mind about your poems in that way is that I've learned a lot, like just from reading your poems, I'll have to like look some references up and even, you know, the title of the book, Paso Doble, like just learning all those. And who was the um, Russian ballerina? Oh, uh, Nijinsky. Super Nijinsky. cool stuff that I... Yeah. And then I'll, I'll, I can read from that poem. Mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about that later. And right now, I'm going to read Roscoe came back in February, inspired by the picture of the Junko. Yeah. When red, blue, yellow lights were still on a string wound round a bleached lichen covered rail, and a band of snow was a layer of resignation. Roscoe came back as Junko and considered his untitled painting, looking as if he was his later works or triptychs in his chapel. Black and gradually gray, subtracting color, his feathers melted into shadow or white snow, becoming all things and a mixture of things. February is the heart's most brutal month Every four years, it adds a day to itself, prolonging its feathered dark days. Rothko Junko told me, from three colors, you can make any color, and everything can be replaced with nothing. And I'll just show the, the photograph again. I just, I love this photograph. Yeah. Just that the moment and the colors and the layers and all the elements come together and um i've you know it's it's just really well, inspirational you, for you to come up with a poem like that from that photo your background in art is phenomenal like your knowledge of history of art is pretty amazing oh, did you and we we talked about um you know, learning and, and art and, you know, that's part of the journey, right? That's part of the creative journey. You're always learning, you're always experimenting. Um, and another thing that was, was, that I've found kind of interesting about our collaboration is that, um, you know, it's not strictly just uh, a call and response mm -hmm. with a, with a, photograph and, and a poem. I mean, you would tell me how you got a particular photograph. Um, you know, you describe the scenario. So there, in a, in a very real way, there is an underlying narrative structure mm -hmm. to the photographs that informs the poem. And um, especially the one I asked you to right to <laughs> yeah yeah well the at the bathhouse is a, a good example of that um you know you'd you'd been asked to participate in the juno photography exhibition i don't do you want to talk a bit about that well it was a for the junos they do like a artist's other art, so like musicians, I guess, or whoever involved in the music industry's other art form. So it's not just photography, it can be actual visual art or sculpture, anything. And so, yeah, they asked me to put in a photo for that. And it was in my hometown of uh, London, Ontario. Unfortunately, I didn't even get to go that year. We were on tour, 
and not nominated, but it was in the London Museum and I got pictures from people that went and saw it. So that was exciting. And you did a poem for that picture, which the story behind that photo, it's a snowy owl. And we were at Bath House, which is the Tragically Hip studio recording our third record, Pray For It. Um, and we went out, my wife and I- Can everyone I see the photograph? Sorry, Danny. Can everyone see the photograph? Good, okay. Sorry, Danny. And then, so we went out, we were actually going, I was engaged and we were gonna get married in the summer. So we were going to do a food tasting in Kingston. It just happened to be close. Um, and so on the way out, my wife spotted this owl and we went and did the food tasting and then drove back by it and it was still sitting there. So I like, as soon as I got back to the studio, I grabbed my camera and drove out and got these pictures. It just sat there for hours. Um, and yeah, so. Those, those eyes are just incredible. It's a beautiful bird and it always has a, like I'll always remember that as something associated with Bathhouse and obviously Gord Downey and just the history of that studio was really cool. Yeah. Um, so we had um, the first the first tune that we had done our demo for uh, for our new project was at the bathhouse, um, and uh, it, I really really enjoyed working on that that poem as well. Um, so at that poem, yeah, yeah, that was uh, yeah at the bathhouse. That was our our demo. So you know. Um, as we're going through these, um, this next kind of phase of the project, what can you talk about as a musician, what it's like to be um, creating music in response to a poem? I mean, it's, it's it essentially becomes lyrics, I'm thinking, or what, what's your thought process? Well, the one you sent me, was uh, I had you record your poem to a click track, which people know, don't know. A click track's basically like a, met it's a metronome. So it just keeps the rhythm. So you did your poem to that and then sent me just your lyrics. And then I started with drums. I just played to what you had played. And it's similar kind of to like how I would make, you know, any sort of music. Sometimes I'm inspired by, I'll have a sample of something or, you know, if I'm collaborating with another artist like Eamon McGrath, who I've been collabor collaborating with a lot recently, he'll send me like an acoustic track or a piano or something. And you just kind of play off that. So not every song is the same, but your lyrics inspired a real rhythm and you did it to 120 BPM but it's very much, it was halftime. So I recorded it in like a halftime 60 beat per minute, almost funky way. And I can really see even more down the road as this becomes more of a thing. I should probably be like looking at the photo, listening to the lyrics, reading the lyrics and really being inspired by like all of those different, that's what would make it really cohesive. So. Well, I'm, I'm going to read this, this poem that we've been talking about called At the Bath House, mm -hmm. November 18th, 2018. The drummer set down his sticks and walked toward that silence. Outside the studio near the highway, he saw the gold eyed owl and named it. A downy hi-hat note resting on a worn wood clef above an X of barbed wire. Both emerged from somewhere pure between music and indestructible matter. Outside the studio near the highway, he saw the gold-eyed owl and named it. To see an owl in the daylight is a good omen, the drummer had been told. Both emerged from somewhere pure, between music and indestructible matter. Truth be told, it had been foretold in the beat of a drum and the words in a song. To see an owl in the daylight is a good omen, the drummer had been told. The owl and drummer were old and newborn at the same moment. 
Truth be told, it had been foretold in the beat of a drum and the words in a song. There are places I've never been and always wanted to go. The owl and drummer were old and newborn at the same moment. A downy hi-hat note resting on a worn wood clef above an X of barbed wire. There are places I've never been and always wanted to go. The drummer set down his sticks and walked toward that silence. And the line, there are places I've never been and always wanted to go, um, is from the tragically hip song, Fly. And um, the bathhouse is, and you could probably talk more about this, Danny, the bathhouse is where the tragically hip uh, did the recordings. And I mm -hmm. tried to work that that into the poem as well. I think I called, oh, I think I called the photo gourd or something. So that was also a thing, I feel. But yeah. Well, and, and you know, it, that whole process kind of speaks to the narrative of um, this, these kinds of, of poems, for me anyway, because it's, the process is so multi-layered. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you add another artist into the mix, it, it becomes a much more interesting exercise for, for me as um, a writer. And, and in, in some respects, the COVID lockdown, um, uh, yeah, it's been a hardship for everybody for sure. But in some, some respects as a writer, um, it's kind of, you know, par for the course. I spend a lot of time by myself anyway with right. my work. And what's it, what's the creative process been like for you, Danny, in terms of COVID and your studio and recording, that kind of thing? Well, I think a combination of things have all kind of meshed together for me right now. And it's still early days of me doing a lot of my own stuff, but we got a house in Hamilton, so I have space for more, like actually having my drums in the house. And I've bought a lot of instruments and like I've been working on music on my own for probably two years, like just strictly on my own, I guess. But really being able as I moved into the studio and when I was living with Brian and Leslie before we moved here, just like really bunkering down and focusing a lot on I have the time basically because we were on the road for so much and as an artist when you're playing the same songs every night you're getting better you're definitely getting better and you're getting tighter but you're not necessarily growing as an artist or a musician so what COVID has kind of done along with having my own space and everything has let me just like grow as a an artist a musician and explore other types of music I recently on Kijiji got a really nice set of uh, congas from like a professional conga guy that was moving to Cuba. And I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy like percussion as an instrument, you know what I mean? Like it's really now I'm like addicted to percussion. So it's just a whole other level that I wasn't really exploring before. And I've definitely been playing a lot more keys and guitar and just producing in general. I'm no, by no means like a great guitar, guitar player or anything like that, but it's all just been a, COVID has helped me been able to have the time to just learn. Mm -hmm. I to learn. But I definitely, and I think I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I missed the road a little bit, you know what I mean? But yeah, mm -hmm. it's been nice as a, as growth. Yeah. And I think I asked you once as well, um, what you think about when you're drumming. There's, there's been a, a kinesiologist that's been studying drummers, right? And she, and she studied you. And I think, you know, if you could talk a little bit about that process and about what is kind of in your mind when you're drumming, or is it such a, is there such a, a mind body connection between yourself and your sticks that you don't even think about it? Well, that's, yeah. I mean, when you're playing songs in a band, like when I'm playing with July Talk, 
it's so much better not to think. It's mm -hmm. better to be well rehearsed and in a good headspace that you don't think because once you do think you're like, okay, here comes the fill. That's when you screw the fill up. And so you really just want to like stay, try to stay in a groove and just not think about anything because you also want to be able to re react to the other members of the band. You never know what's going to happen, especially in July talk with Peter and Leia as your front people. We've had many different variables, <laughs> whether it's interacting on purpose or something goes wrong or, you know, a fan or if someone in the crowd does something or someone's instrument goes out. There's just so much going on that you want to, I don't know, you have to be ready for anything, but at the same time, you don't want to be thinking about it. You want to just mm -hmm. read. Well, and I think as a writer too, especially with a project like this, you, you want the poem and the photograph to be, in a sense, seamless. So, you know, again, I go back to this, this idea of the call and response. I mean, certainly without having the, the photographs here, um, it's hard for people to, uh, to see, you know, in, in, and I do hope people take the time to go to your website, mm -hmm. but there should be a blurring of lines between the photograph and, and the poem. And I wanted to show another one of your photographs that inspired um, one of the poems in the collection. And you like vultures. I love vultures. My favorite um, bird is probably the California condor, which I've never seen because uh, they're the biggest bird, like biggest wingspan land bird, I guess, in North America. And they almost went extinct in, I think, 1987. So there was only like 14 left in the world. They basically live in like the Grand Canyon. I don't, I don't know. I don't think there's a lot in California. They mostly are because of the space they live in like the Grand Canyon and stuff. But yeah, it was like lead poisoning and from like, because they are scavengers and people would hunt with lead bullets and then they would get lead poisoning from eating that. And then also just from strictly humans you know, being invasive was another thing, but. Well, that, that photograph inspired this poem called The Beauty of Vultures. And I open it with an epigraph from HD. If you cannot be seduced by beauty, you cannot learn the wisdom of ugliness. Vultures can't sing, but when they strike a triad on this gray tin roof, the middle vulture spreads its wings across an octave of gizzard ground gruntings. I am pulled toward the ugly. My first imaginings were faces of monsters and trolls and crones. In fairy tales, my mother fed me from the one book we owned. Like a vulture's featherless head, this book had no cover, but my mother and I scavenged from its insides the beautiful and doomed, the ugly and snide. Vultures vomit feed their chicks. What's digested gritty and made useful. It sticks. So memories of decay, wisely used, carry on. I just, uh, it, it, the, 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 the photograph just, made me think of about vultures in a whole new way and and hearing you speak so lovingly about the birds just thought well maybe i haven't been giving them a fair shake i even started to look at magpies differently yeah well they get a little bit of a uh, i think they get a little bit of a bad rap because they don't have any feathers on their head so they're not the most i mean i think they're beautiful but a lot of people think they're kind of gross looking and the reason they don't have feathers on their head is because they are scavengers and they're, you know, eating carcasses. And it's just less 
potential to get disease, I believe, is why they don't have feathers on their head. Yeah. Well, the, the photograph really spoke to me. What are, um, I'm just wondering as well, where, you know, like vultures you love, and, and I, you know, I was thinking that I hadn't been giving them enough <laughs> credit, giving them their due. What are some other instances, maybe not even with birds, but in your just general pursuit of wildlife photography, what are some kind of unexpected, you know, things that have happened as you've been trying to get photographs, either here in North America or... I don't know if you're meaning to do this, but it does lead up to, what's the poem, the fawn and the... You got it right there. Yeah, the fawn in the afternoon. Fawn in the, the afternoon, the great example. I mean, I don't know if you have that photo, but it's basically, okay, well, let me find it. I was in Toronto and I was just near, I was kind of near the Don Valley Trail and just near some like train tracks. And I was looking, I thought I heard a blue jay. So I was looking for a blue jay to take a picture of and I was like looking through the bushes and all of a sudden I just kind of like look and I'm face to face with a deer that's just staring at me through the bush. And he's like, not even scared. He's just staring at me. And I got a bunch of photos of it. Um, but it, those types of experiences are so cool when you're just connecting with nature and it's unexpected. Yeah. I'm just trying I to. People can relate. Like, in a way, it's like, I mean, I just got a dog, but connecting with your pets is such a, it's a really cool feeling too. And I'm just, you know, I thought I had that photo right by me. Um, hold on here. Let me read the poem. Um, again, a bit of a bit of setup. So um, I will find this photograph. Um, but the the angle and the tilt of this deer's head made me think of a photograph of Nijinsky, the famous ballet dancer. And there's no film of him. Uh, Diaghilev is, is a uh, controlling Svengali-like master, wouldn't let any, um, any, anyone film him. So there's just photographs. And this really struck me. And the background of Danny's photograph reminded me of uh, the sets that Nijinsky um, danced to. And uh, the, the designer was, was named Bast. So all of these elements kind of came together for this poem. A fawn in the afternoon. Nijinsky's ghost appeared in a green wood against Bast's set with its dancing gold. In the afternoon when the leaves shivered like a scarf and the drummer heard Debussy's haunted tone. When the leaves danced like a scarf, the drummer heard Debussy, whose ghost was gold against Bast's set. Nijinsky appeared in a green wood in the afternoon. As the drummer shivered in a green wood, Nijinsky's ghost danced with a scarf and Bast's Set haunted the leaves in the afternoon, and the drummer heard Debussy's gold tone. Debussy haunted the drummer. Nijinsky danced with Bach's ghost. In the afternoon, shivering and set with gold, the fawn appeared in a green wood. One of my favorites. I even yeah, got well to move that one. Oh, you better, you better show, yeah. You better display the tattoo, I think. On my hand, I have a WC haunted the drummer. I thought that line was one really powerful and also, you know, it, it kind of why is he haunting the drummer and in which way? You know what I mean? It's, uh, it was a cool line. It just sounds really neat. And in the, uh, you know, again, 
Does, it, y'all, does everyone know who Debussy is? You I think know. so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Classical composer. I, Which, yeah, I, I, I don't know about, but. It definitely the your poem inspired me to look more into it for sure. Yeah, and I think I've got my hands finally on this picture. Apologies. My screen is just frozen. Okay, here we go. Can everyone see? Nope, not yet. No? Okay, hold on. Well, that was an experiment that didn't work. <laughs> Let me see if I can find it, uh, it just a, a photo of it on its own, because I've got it in the book. Oh. I just don't have it on its own. But suffice to say that the, the photograph had a very painterly quality, and I don't know um, I mean, you spoke specifically about about encountering this deer, Danny, mm. but I don't know as a photographer technically how you would um, achieve that kind of that kind of effect. Well, I mean, I think sometimes some of my like photos that are people's favorites are sometimes not the most technically great. They just I feel like. And I really like these ones too, because they're better as almost like art and as like a portrait. So my Raven photo, for instance, which I got in Edmonton actually, is very blown out in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but it like, which made the, the Raven look so black and the sky look so white. So it just looks like a Raven doing like this really interesting shape um, on a white background, complete white background. So I mean, yeah, so, that's kind of a blown out photo. You're not really seeing any of the other, but so the similarity, like that deer photo, because it was in the bush and it was so dark, it gave that kind of effect. Okay, now let's see if I can. And it also looks kind of great because there's there's light coming through the leaves onto its face. So it's got like a yellow green color to that photo. Okay. Now can we see? Yeah. Hold on. There it is. Yeah, see, so like technically that's kind of a mistake. Or there was a leaf in front of it. Like it's yeah. nose, I guess you call it, right? Um, but yeah, but it looks all blurred out and kind of cool. Which I really then, like those types of photos. I think it's more artistic. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the Nijinsky um, photograph as well, uh, where he he is dancing the part of the fawn in the ballet of the, the same name, A Fawn in the Afternoon. His costume has that right. effect as well. Um, so again, there's that cross pollination of the photograph, painting, dance, the I set, think the, the costume. The, the most mind-blowing one, I can't remember what the poem is called, but really one of the most mind-blowing ones is where you took, you have my photo of the female cardinal. You, I know you have them with you. And you have yes. the painting. What's the painting again? Egon Sheila. Right. But the fact so that this, you saw, and I can see it, I can see it, but your brain went right there. <laughs> so this photograph of Danny's, I absolutely loved. And it also put me in mind of the Egon Sheila painting, a woman in an orange dress. So. The colors are very similar. It's really interesting. Very similar. Um, and so again, there's that cross pollination and Egon Schiele was, was 
not a nice guy. Um, and Edith, uh, he, yeah, he, he, treated, he treated women terribly. So I wrote this poem from the viewpoint of Edith Sheila, his, his wife. And the title is Edith Sheila, a Cardinal Redressed. Egon's female kneeling in an orange-red dress was me, heavy or light as the substance of feathers and linen skies. With dead leaves in my mouth, my weight chalked and painted, he foregrounded my face and seed eye, trapped me in pose and repose. I have met my doppelganger, this northern cardinal redressed, crested, wing-wrapped and wearing my seed eye. She is a claw on that tree's finger bone, the flume of my respectable. Once the thick moon was eclipsed by cadmium trailing a black thread, a cardinal inked sky saying, quick, come quick, Egon drawing on my deathbed. It is October 28th, look at me, don't look at me, you nodded painted bird. I will keep this warm red turning in my mouth until you go. And Edith and Egon both died in the so-called Spanish flu. So another another strange connection twist and what connection to what we're what we're going through. Um, but yeah, there's uh, you know just when you're talking about the technical aspects of the photograph and some of you know people's favorites not being the most what what you'd consider technically the best mm -hmm. are, are are appealing on a very emotional level on a you know a, a painterly level on an artistic level and i think i think that's important for people mm -hmm. when they're uh, you know when they're trying to make a connection with your work and, and with, with any any art really is that sense of connection. Well, I think um, one, one thing that's slightly, and this I think is because I'm not like a, like I am a birder and I am a nature photographer, but at the same time, I feel like I'm also, I'm, I want to bring a sense of art into it as well, because I feel like you can have a lot of bird photography I see are amazing crisp photos of an animal and that that's a purpose they have a purpose but there's not like necessarily they're not framing it in a way that you're like I want to put that on my wall whereas like I do want like those are my most cherished photos is if I'm like okay that'd be a really cool print you know to put on someone's wall or something mm -hmm. so that's just my approach which I think is not to say I'm a hunt, way different than every other bird photographer out there, but that's my approach when I'm looking at the birds and trying to get that photo is like, how can I make this a little more artistic, I guess? Then mm -hmm. it's like, here, look at this beautiful animal. And it's yeah. Not, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and have you had those kinds of, you know, eureka moments where, you you've gotten a shot and you know it's going to be really good and you know you have, you, you have it like literally both ways like there'll be there's times where i'm like that's can like you're just like that's good like that you know the bathhouse one mm -hmm. like that's, gonna be good. that's uh the background you could tell that the background has these like really beautiful reds and the owls just beautiful in the wood and you're like it's just set up and framed in the it's easily framed whereas other times uh you don't even you get home and you upload your camera and you look at your photos and you're like whoa okay i didn't realize that photo even existed how did i get that um and then there's other times the opposite where you think you have something so great and then you put it on your computer and you look and you're like oh it's blurry or like you just didn't quite catch what you thought you know what i mean so there's all yeah, it's, it, ups and downs, really. Yeah, it's like that in, in writing as well. Um, who was it that said you're supposed to kill your darlings? So 
So <laughs> the things that you think are, re- you know, yeah, got it. And then you go back yeah. and you think, well, this, this is terrible. Yeah. Um, but I've had, I've had experiences when, especially when I first started writing um, in response to your photographs. I think I wrote about 10 really, really quickly. And that, that's unusual. It was just like this, um, you know, something took over and it, they just, the, the poems just seemed to spring unbidden. So it was, it was really interesting. I think the first one that I wrote was the molted peacock photograph. Yeah. That's the first poem I wrote. Got that one, the show and tell. That was in Victoria, BC. Yeah. I feel like that one, I like I knew I had something there, one of them. I don't take a ton of photos either. There's a lot of people that'll go out there with their automatic, like, and just, you know, machine gun shoot. I find that very wasteful. I'm like, you don't, I don't know if you took 25 pictures in two seconds, is it really going to be that different? I don't know. I guess they're flying off. You can get some cool stuff, but. Yeah. So the, the, your process is to be much more focused and concentrated and, and um, I guess tidy yeah. in your, yeah, I, tidy I in your. Wanna, I don't want to have, part of it's like, I just want to like, you know, watch and try to get the, right picture but at the same time also I don't want to come home and just have like a thousand photos I have to go through at the same time well and I think too the the what I really liked about the peacock photograph was that it's a peacock that's molted I mean when when people think of peacocks they think of you know the NBC logo and the the peacock's tail feathers all you know um opening up into this beautiful logo whereas this is just so uh unusual in that it's i i I didn't even know peacocks molted so there you go i learned i learned so much from this project um and so when i saw that photograph it made me think well okay if if the big draw for the peacock is is the beautiful tail feathers and he's trying to attract the peahen what would the peahen be thinking when she saw this dude so that's the poem that i wrote um and i'll i'll read this last one here a letter from the peahen to the molted peacock you trained your blue and green hundred-eyed tail on me because you wanted me to choose I've seen that gaudy display too often. Hardly registers, stirs nothing in me. Your tail's molted, turned a blind eye. That makes me care. It's your song that interests me now. Come on, sing me a song before or after. It's a peahen's pick, peahen to my peacock. You pulled Hera's chariot, I've been told, and I fancy that's no featherweight tail. Your crest is more like flowers than feathers. Take off your hat and I'll catch the bouquet. Your tail opened with too many eyes. I said, close your eyes. Close your eyes. And that was the first, that was the first one. You know what really got me about your poems? The first was that I didn't know really what to expect. I knew you had talent. I knew that there, you know, it was going to be good, but I didn't, you always have like this, some of them have like some really dark message, like not messages, but like dark themes. Yeah. Also like kind of like this picture inspired something that's like almost politically driven and a real issue. Like the one's about war, is it not? Yeah, there's, there's one about the, uh, uh, yeah, war. I take some lines from W. H. Auden, um, the Anthropocene era. Um, yeah, uh, as I said, it it really was unpredictable 
to me what these photos would evoke. Um, and, and I think having, having the poems bring in, obviously inspired by your photographs, but um, for, the, for those photos to trigger so many other ideas and so many other, um, you know, artists, and songs and musicians and have all of those things weave themselves into the into the poem i think elevates the piece from just simply the call and response that we've talked about before um to become its its own thing but undeniably connected to the photograph so the poem and the photograph should be kind of one thing, right? Yeah, yeah well, I'm um, blown away that you are drawing all of those different things from a bird photo. I really didn't expect that, to be honest. <laughs> like when you were like, when I read that poem, I was like, oh, yes, there's some bird reference stuff, but there's an underlying, you know, thing going on here. Yeah. And I think that that's uh, we'll we'll be able to take that to the next the next stage of of the uh, of the project. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, um, Catherine, I'm not sure how you want the event to unfold. Um, did you want to open the floor to to Q and A's now? For sure. Uh, there hasn't been any questions come in yet, but if anyone does have a question and wants to type it in the chat, or if you uh, want to unmute yourself and just ask it directly, um, please go ahead. Thank you both so far for um, this discussion. It's been brilliant. The poetry is uh, so beautiful. The um, photographs are beautiful as well. It's been really interesting seeing the, the interplay between the two. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, is there anyone who has any questions right now? <laughs> you answered wow. You answered wow. everything. <laughs> <laughs> We've solved the universe's problems. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I'm just wondering what like the actual back and forth, like did you, you see a picture and, and then write a draft of the poem and share it with Danny? And then did you like, was, was there actual like response emails back and forth or like, I'm curious that side of things, um, how that worked or if it was more like a solitary writing and then sharing it um, sort of after the well, fact. Well, uh, I think at first, um, Danny, you just sent me uh, some photographs and then I, I wrote in response to those photographs and sent the poems back to you. And I think that gave you, uh, I think a better sense of where this could go. Yeah, I mean, at first, I think you just were, you saw some of my photos on Facebook, I feel like, and you wrote about, you're like, do you want to do a little collab? I'm like, you basically, I said you were inspired one day. I was like, sure, let's try something. I didn't know what to expect. It's really like out of my wheelhouse. It's not yeah. like anything else I've ever done. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, the writing's most, it's like the photos were mostly me and the writing was mm -hmm. you. Like, it's really a inspirational back and forth type of thing and um i would just start sending her photos like the day i got photos i was like do you do it do you like any of these ones like <laughs> so <laughs> well and the, at the at the bathhouse was um a, a bit different because you had taken this photograph of the owl which we, we shared earlier mm -hmm. and had said you know there's the opportunity for me to have this photograph exhibited let's have you know but do you, do you think you could come up with a poem and of course I could mm -hmm. um and so that was a little bit different mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting yeah anyways that that photo that one was perfect for like that Juno thing because it was so inspired by Bathhouse and Gord Downey and there was just a music connection to it as well mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. Um, Wendy, do you get your ideas and your inspiration from either 
people you've met, education, books you've read, you know, travels? Oh, all of those things. Um, I think it's really important as a writer and an artist to keep yourself open to all your life experiences. I'm a great eavesdropper. Um, I love to listen in on people's conversations. Not so much in COVID, obviously, because we're not really getting out. And not, no one's really talking in, in grocery store lineup. But certainly outside COVID, I'm just, uh, you know, such an eavesdropper wherever, wherever I go. So I gather up those little, little bits and pieces like a magpie. Um, and traveling, I, I take inspiration from, I definitely take inspiration from what I'm reading. But I, I think the most important thing for me is to leave myself open to where my writing might, might take me because you read, that's, that's part of the, the joy of it. And that's part of the discovery is not knowing um, where, where a certain project will go or where a poem will go or a story or a book. And that's, that's the fun part. That's a good question. Yeah. Amazing. Guess that's it. I guess I, I want to. I want to give people time in case they're formulating their questions. <laughs> um, I guess in 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 the meantime, where can people access and see your your um, photographs? Is there uh, do you have a website? I think it was mentioned you had a website. Um, yeah, I have a www.drummerswholovebirds.com. I am selling uh, prints on there, and all the proceeds. Right now, we'll go to the Edmonton Public Library. So yeah, I'll it's very kind of you. <laughs> donate all the profits to the Edmonton Public Library. Um, yeah, I'm excited just to to check them out. They sound really yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Wendy, um, a lot of your books are in the Edmonton Public Library, but where else can people access your books? Um, I would suggest going if you're in Edmonton, visit your local bookstore, Audrey's, Glass Bookshop, or you can order straight from my publisher, New West Press. Um, yeah, but it, it, regardless of whether you're in Hamilton or Toronto or Edmonton or Sherwood Park, please take books out of the library. We love libraries. And visit your local bookstores. It's very important that, especially in these times, that we we keep keep our independent bookstores afloat. For sure. Yeah. Amazon has enough money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, you there will be more coming from Wendy um, as part of her tenure with us as the featured writer um, of Capital City Press for the next few months. You do have another program in the works did you want to talk about that at all uh, give people a heads up in yep in april please join me and brianna toswell who is the owner of penrose press and she and i will be launching an artist book which i'm very excited about another collaboration <laughs> and uh all will be all will be revealed in in april so i encourage you to Keep your eyes peeled for that. Yeah, that uh, the information about that should be up pretty soon. I usually like to wait until the first one's done, but I'll I'll be posting more information on the website there. You can find out more at epl.ca slash capital city press for all the things we do. Uh, but the information for this program will go up. I do I did get a little sneak um, peek at what it might be talking about, what it might be about, and it sounds really, really exciting. I'm so excited for it. Uh, we have other programs coming up as well. Uh, March 27th, which is a Saturday at 11 a.m., I'll be interviewing uh, Vivian Manask, uh, who is a local architect and writer who's just launched a book. Um, so that information about that is on the website. And our current writer in residence, Fern Thiessen, is hosting Marty Chan. Um, I think it's April 7th. I think it's a oh, Tuesday or Wednesday night. Um, 
I might have the date wrong. That information will be on there, but he's um, hosting Marty in a talk about how to write for children. Um, so lots of really cool um, local writing and reading um, events coming up. And like I said, you can find it all on epl.ca slash capacity press. Um, if there's nothing more, I just want to say again, thank you to Wendy and Danny for, for joining us tonight for such a wonderful talk. Um, and I'm really inspired and I'm gonna go check out that website for the photographs. Um, so thank you both. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks okay. Edmonton Public Library. Thank you, Danny, and thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. It was, it was great. Bye. Great night, thank you. <laughs>